from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Now, for what we are really all here for, Holly Robinson Pete, I'm so excited. Uh, she is a force and a woman of many talents. Of course, we all know her as an actress, a singer, an author, of course. She has been in the entertainment industry for most of her life and found success in hit movies and shows like 21 Drum Street. And of course, my personal favorites, Hanging with Mr. Cooper and For Your Love. Um, but there are a few other talents that she touts on her Instagram, and I think we should, they're really highly important. Um, first, mom of four. Of course, she is a resolution seeker, a philanthropist. And then a few that I don't think we know too much about. Uh, plumber, Uber driver, and dog interpreter. And I, I guess as a mom of four, you do what must be done. Um, and she is doing what must be done. Her philanthropic efforts through her and her husband's organization, Holly Rod Foundation, have won, not only won awards for compassionate service, but have placed a national spotlight on two causes very personal to the Pete family, Parkinson's disease and autism. Holly Robinson Pete is an award-winning author and has won an, an NAACP Image Award for her outstanding literary work in her children's book entitled My Brother Charlie about autism from the sibling's perspective, co-authored by her daughter, Ryan Elizabeth Pete. Her latest book, Same But Different, Teen Life on the Autism Express, paints an important story of hope for teens and families living with autism and lets us all see that everybody's rhythm, unique rhythm is worth dancing to. The book was co-written by her with her twin children, Ryan Elizabeth Pete and RJ Pete, who is diagnosed with autism at the age of three. Holly Robinson Pete continues to do what must be done and more to inspire teens and families living with autism. And we appreciate her and her family for being a symbol of hope and light for us all. So without further ado, please help me welcome Holly Robinson Pete. Thank, so Thank you so much. What a great introduction. Can you come back home with me to LA and just introduce me like that every morning? <laughs> Imagine if you woke up you know, every morning and you were introduced like that to your kids. That'd be fabulous. Um, I am, let me find my clicker. Voila. I am so excited to be here today. Uh, what an amazing festival. It's my first time here and I absolutely love it. Thank you to all of you who came to this presentation today. Um, as you, as many of you know, if you didn't know before, um, you know, I am a mom first, a mom of four, and I have a son with special needs, and it's been pretty much the narrative of my life for the last 18 years. Um, and there's nothing more fulfilling than when you have a situation that happens to you that can be quite devastating, and then you're able to eventually see it as a blessing because you're able to touch others. It's a really tremendous feeling. So I'm just absolutely thrilled to be able to be here and share my story with you. Um, Oh, okay, so it works. Y'all, listen, that's the first thing. You're just so excited that the clicker works. Um, so my brother, uh, uh, we're going to talk about Same But Different, which is our new book. Uh, my Brother Charlie is a book I'm super proud of. I came to Scholastic many years ago, and I pitched this book, and... Um, you know, went to several publishers and they really didn't get it. They really didn't get the pervasive um, uh, uh, prevalence of autism and they just didn't understand. And certainly in, in uh, communities of color where our children are diagnosed two to five years later than other children, it was really important to have a book like this, especially from the siblings' perspective. And so these are my twins. Oh, yeah, they're, not, they're, they're 18, so the awe factor's gone. Um, <laughs> But back then, it was all oh, so cute, born in 97. Um, this is my dad. So many of you of a certain age will remember my dad was the original Gordon on Sesame Street. Yeah. He, um, he is my inspiration for reading for, I mean, the man could tell a story like you couldn't m imagine. And he wrote so many stories as Gordon on Sesame Street. He was the original Gordon. So that was like 69 to 72. 
and he was an amazing man, um, awesome writer, wrote for everything from Sanford and Son Cosby Show, uh, The Waltons. I mean, he's a guy who really had a lot to, to contribute to, to this uh, television and, um, and entertainment, but was uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at only 45. Yeah, it was deep because it was in the 80s and I just was a freshman in college and I didn't know what, you know, what Parkinson's was and we didn't have the internet and Google yet, no Muhammad Ali. We just didn't have a whole lot and it was kind of a scary time. But through him, it, it led me to a life of service and then through our books, we were able to serve even more. So here's some more cute pictures of the twins. But I love this picture because you can tell when RJ was just diagnosed around this time, Ryan was really there for him. You know, she always turned his frown upside down, like we used to say, and she's always had his back. Um, we got our diagnosis in 1999. We call it the never day because it, we were told he was never going to be so many things. This, this uh, pediatrician just basically, bless her heart, decided she was going to give us a laundry list of what he would never do at three years old. So. It's very, you know, there's a, that comes with a lot of audacity to be able to tell a parent that your kid will never say I love you, never do a whole bunch of things um, that he eventually ended up doing. So I want to quickly play this little quick video uh, that uh, Ryan, his twin sister, and his uh, little brothers made. So that's why it's a little bit, you know, it looks young. It's, I, it's not uh, professional. But it just gives a very good first-person narrative of who RJ is. My name is Rodney Jackson P. Some people call me RJ, but I like Rodney better. When I was three, a doctor told my mom and dad I had autism. Autism means I have a brain that is different. I did not really speak too well until I was six. I did not really make friends. I cried a lot. I felt weird in my body. People don't understand my world. It was hard. Can you imagine feeling something but not being able to say it? Mom and Dad did everything for me to get me better. Thankfully, they could do that. I wish other kids could do some things I could do now. A lot of families do not have enough money to help their kids get better. That makes me sad. I wish there was a place where you could go and not pay and get help. I like the NBA and the MLB. I could tell you all the players' names on every team, but I really have a hard time making friends. The doctor said I would never play team sports. Wrong! Never do. The doctor said I would never make friends. Wrong! You gotta have help. Doctor said I would never say I love you on my own, but I do all the time. My twin sister wrote a book about autism. I'm so proud of her. My mom and I wrote a song about autism. Wanna hear it? I may have autism, but autism doesn't have me. So that's RJ. So that's RJ, and you can see he's a, he's a sweet kid, and he didn't have language for so long. And we really wanted to use his example to give other people hope, because that's really what we didn't have when we got our diagnosis. We wrote this book for many reasons, um, very obvious reasons. I mean, autism is very you know, prevalent right now. Um, and we wanted to uh, promote awareness. Um, but in the end, it was really about hope. It was really about peddling hope, making sure that people that were given the diagnosis that we were given can know that our kids can eventually become part of society and be loved and they have talents. And we're always talking about what they can't do, but we wanted to show what they can do. Um, so one of the reasons that we started uh, in, I started becoming an author is because I went to school one day, my daughter Ryan said, no one knows at school what autism is, mom, so we gotta tell them, because no one knows, it's like third grade or fourth grade. And so, I said, well, dad and I will go down to school and have a conversation. She was like, that's okay, I don't need, we don't need you to go down to school. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, Ryan, you have to understand, like, we need to come down there and have a conversation. You don't have to be in the classroom, but we need to explain it. And so, she gave us the bullet points 
on what to say and what not to say. She said, don't, obviously don't embarrass us. She said, make it a level playing field and accentuate the positive sense of humor. You know, the first thing that we said to this group of fourth graders was, you know, what do you do well? What don't you do well? And one kid was like, I really play football well, but I don't read good. Um, and another kid said, you know, I'm great at math, but I don't know how to play soccer. And I said, well, RJ can tell you the names of every single president and vice president. Um, he can tell you the name of every single player in every sports league that exists, uh, but he has a hard time making friends. And it was amazing, like this fog just lifted over them, and it was pretty awesome. Um, autism in America is out of control, quite frankly. There uh, are so many kids diagnosed with, with this disorder. It's very mysterious. We didn't know about it until we were impacted by it. And the more we talk about it, the more we write books about it, the more the stigma goes away. And that's another goal of ours. Um, just These are now RJ's growing up now. He's, you know, getting hair on his face. And, yeah, I'm always trying to cut it while he's sleeping. I try to <laughs> shave him. I really do try to shave him while he's sleeping. Cause he, um, and he's just been awesome. So we decided we would do a reality show because why not? <laughs> because, so when I pitched this reality show to my family, I said, it's not going to be like, um, don't worry, there won't be anybody throwing drinks in anyone's face, and there are no fights, uh, but I felt like, just like with our books and going on different shows, um, I wanted to continue the narrative, and I felt like it would be really helpful for people to see us in our lives and how we rally around RJ, and, you know, just... We were married 21 years, you know, we're not a perfect family at all, but we felt like it would be interesting, interesting to show our journey. Um, and so we're in our second, we're about to start our second season in February. Um, we're on the Oprah Winfrey Network. The show's called For Pete's Sake, and I just bought a couple clips. And this just is really, you know, obviously I, we're here at a book fest, it's not a, a television convention, but I wanted to share a couple of clips because I wanted you to see sort of, this is an extension of our work as authors. When RJ and I were three years old when he was first diagnosed with autism, he was having a lot of trouble communicating. I'd almost be his voice and I'd often speak for him in times. I've always been in RJ's corner. Go to USC. You want me to go to USC? Yeah, go to your dad's old school. Whatever she wants to do, I'll go with it and I'll support her. But I want her to go to USC so she's close to me a lot. Well, she went to NYU. She didn't go to U <laughs> so, so much for being close. We took her uh, last month with cameras in tow. She was a little mortified that she would be the freshman checking in with cameras following her, but it, it was New York, honey. Didn't nobody even noticed. <laughs> no one even noticed. Um, and here's another clip. Are you kidding me with that photo? So that's our lead picture. You modeled it like an absolute champion. That one. Oh my god. It's over. Are you f excuse me? <laughs> it happens. Um, that was when we were trying to find a job for RJ. You know, where's he gonna work? What's he gonna do? How's he gonna self advocate? How's he gonna make his own money? And everyone had their own input about what this what would be best for him. I wanted him to work at the bird store, the pet store, because he likes pets and birds. And, and um, so he went down there and tried that. My husband wanted him to work at Witch Witch. I don't know if you guys have Witch Witch. It's like a Subway sandwich place. And uh, we knew the manager, because my husband was worried that he wanted someone to shadow him. Uh, my mom was like, my, my grandson is fine. He needs to be a model. And so she took him to a modeling agency, and then those were the pictures. And we were like, oh, dang, <laughs> like, you, you could really do this. Um, and so that was last year. Um, and then I'll get to what ended up happening. I'll spoil it for you. Not for you, but yeah, for you. I'll spoil it for you. Um, and then here's another clip. My hope for all children with autism is to know how special they are. When I was like three, the doctor told me I had autism and I couldn't speak, but when I got a little older, I started to speak, I started to talk more, and I, now I can't stop talking. <laughs> when RJ was diagnosed with autism, there was a lady sitting across from us that told us he would never be able to speak, let alone make a speech. 
To see him be an autism advocate is so awesome. I mean, these moments are things we never thought we, he would, we would ever see him do. So for Pete's sake has been an awesome tool, an awesome extension, an awesome way to to spread what is going on in the autism community, you know, as these kids grow up and become adults. Because we always think of autism as, you know, a three-year-old or two-year-old or five-year-old, but they grow up and they, you know, they need to have relationships. Where are they going to live? What kind of communities are they going to have? Um, so it's been really wonderful to have this extension. Uh, and the books, especially Same But Different, really chronicles this transition or the transition from middle school to high school, you know, what that's like, how Ryan advocated for him, how hard it was for him um, to navigate the things like social media and girlfriends and proms and, you know, just all the high school and middle school things that are difficult for a typical child, let alone a kid that socially is disconnected. And so Same But Different is a book I'm super proud of because we were able to really tell the story in such a beautiful way. And I'm so proud that Andrea, my editor, is here because she was so, it was so important that we tell it in a way that connected with uh, families in a in an uh, authentic way because it's a nuanced journey. It's not something that is very easy to um, classify. And we all say in the autism community, if you've met one kid with autism, you just met one kid with autism. They're all different. And so this was, same but different was a sort of collaboration of our journey plus other people's journeys that we met along the way. Um, okay, oh, wait, hold on, what did I do? Hold on, I knew I was gonna have a clicking problem. All children with Sorry, never mind. Hold on, here we go. Which one is this? Anytime you have oh, yeah. someone that doesn't really understand you, they're not gonna really know how to love you because they don't know who you are. I don't want you to feel sad about not having 25, 30 friends because you only really need one or two good friends, right? Yeah. Mom has Auntie Terry. I have Wonder. You have Wonder. Who always looks out for me. Would Wonder ever put you in a bad position where you were either in harm's way or you did something inappropriate. He would never do that. No. That's a real friend. So in Same But Different, we talk all, um, we explore the themes of friends and friendship. The hardest thing for kids on the spectrum to do is have friends. It's a very difficult thing. My son went through pretty much all of elementary school with no friends. Um, he still struggles with this this theme, and in that scene, you know, he sort of sort of still haunted by an experience in middle school where these boys made him do something and say inappropriate things to uh, to a girl, um, and then you know they had to restrain me to keep me from going down to school because um, <laughs> I was just I needed him to process this and walk through this on his own, uh, but um, he learned from it. He learned the value and the meaning of friendship. Um, but he still, at almost 19, struggles with this theme. So that was part of what we, we talk about in the book um, in several chapters and also what we um, talk about on the show as he moves forward. So here's the spoiler alert. Um, because you all came, I'm going to share this information with you, so act like you didn't see it in February. Uh, but the cool thing is that because of a scene in the whole theme of finding RJ a job in For Pete's Sake, uh, someone from the Los Angeles Dodgers baseball team reached out and saw us on the show, because he saw us on the show and said, Would you, does RJ really need a job? Because I think we have something here for him. And so we were like, yeah, I mean, it was real. He really is looking for a, a gig. And so they said, bring him down to Dodger Stadium. So me and Rodney brought him down, like it was his first day of kindergarten. And we brought him down there, and we literally um, thought we were just having a meeting. And they sent him down to the equipment room. They dressed him up. And now he works at the clubhouse at the Dodgers. And so now he has got this great gig. It is unbelievable, this job for him and what it has done for him. I get the chills just thinking about it. And the best part of that picture, I can't zoom in with this clicker, is the look on his twin sister's face in the background. She is so proud of him and was so concerned about her leaving, going to New York from LA, leaving him alone, and now he has something. Because I have to tell you, when, when she got, you know, the whole process of college, um, it really sort of, it's that reminder that, oh yeah, he is different. He's not going to college like she is. And so for him to have something cool for himself, but this job has given him such a sense of, 
I mean, he walks out with his hands on his hips, and he's just, he's swagger, he's just swagger. And so last night, the Dodgers, I just tweeted something about the Dodgers, like, you know, it was the end of the, uh, it's the end of the regular season, and I said, um, you know, thank you to the Dodgers for, you know, embracing our family, blah, da 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 And one of the Dodgers um, re subtweeted me, and he wrote, um, thank you for RJ, because he makes the clubhouse, like, he gives us energy. He's better for us than I think we are for him. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. So, so that's the, that's a, listen, he comes in at midnight after working because he gets there three hours before the team and he leaves two hours at three, two or three hours after. I mean, it is a job and he comes home. I mean, the only thing he doesn't do is, you know, go to the fridge for a beer. He comes in with his lunchbox, like, you know, he is like, and he wants to talk, you know, he wants to talk about his experience and, and um, so, you know, if it's midnight or one, you know, when you're sleeping, you can feel somebody standing over you, just like, I'm like, yes, RJ. He goes, Mom, can you wake up? Now, this is a kid that couldn't talk before, so I'm obliged to wake up and talk to him. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I can't, what, what can you say? No, I don't want to talk. Uh, so, but he shares so much more. He's connected so much more. And this is a blessing for us, okay? We are a privileged family. It, listen, the elephant in the room is, you know, Rodney played football. I've been on TV all these years, and we have fought for him. We, we, we are very resourceful. But what the Dodgers, the Dodgers hiring him means to me in the bigger picture, not just for my kid, is that these kids are hireable, that they can work in, in big corporations and that everyone needs to make room for them because they have amazing skills. Um, so, oh, what is that? Okay, well, that, that slipped in there. Huh? That's from my 50th birthday party. How'd that get in there? Okay. All right. Oh, was that you? No, you did a great job. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to rush through this because I wanted to get through to a Q&A. Um, I really, it's really important for me. I actually get more from you, like the Dodgers, like with RJ. I get so much from hearing from you and the things you're experiencing. So please, if you have any questions, I would love to hear from you, comments, anything. Um, I think, how much time do we have? 10 minutes. So if you would like to come up and the microphones are right here, please feel free. And you can ask any questions. You can ask about 21 Jump Street and <laughs> anything you want. Yes, ma'am. I'm a teacher in a high school and I run a program for kids with autism. So many of my parents find it hard to accept them as they are and think all my kids are going to college. Not all the kids I teach are going to college, are going to go to college. How did you come to accept RJ for who he is and not say he's going to college like everybody else? How did you do that? Well, you know, I use the example of my husband because he was deeply, deeply steeped in denial for many years to the point where I, I literally had to say to him, you know what, you can go because I have to get this kid going and you are, you are holding me back because you're not able to accept who he is. There's a moment in everyone's life where you realize you, know, you, can't, control, you can't control things and things that are out of control you have to make the best of. Um, I think in, um, with RJ and with any kid who, is, who has a difficulty in uh, experiencing life, we, you know, I always say I can't, I wouldn't change my kid for the world, but I would change the world for my kid. You know, or I would try to change the world. So how about we just allow them to be different and think outside the box and try to give them something that, you know, stop trying to squeeze them and put them in our narrative. So the, the, the conversation of his twin sister going to college and he's not going to college, that was a sobering moment. Because in my mind I knew it, but I never really admitted it. So I think it's just, allowing them to be who they are and understanding who are and coming into their world. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Yes, ma'am. Yes, hi. I'd just like to, first of all, say hi to you because I had, my father had Parkinson's and I also have a 20 year old son with autism. Oh, wow. So I think I've gone through a lot of what you've gone through. Absolutely. And my son actually did make it to college, but I worry about him all the time, mm -hmm. believe me. But um, I just want to ask, do you think, um, Parkinson, uh, not Parkinson's, autism, they keep saying it gets diagnosed more and more every year. Do you think we're just diagnosing it more, or do that many kids just 
is it really that more than it used to be? I mean, my personal feeling, and everyone has an opinion, I'm sure, but my personal feeling is that there's some kind of environmental, predis there's some kind of genetic predisposition that we haven't identified, and then it's triggered by some kind of environmental thing. I do think we're diagnosing it better, but the prevalence is flying up so high that I think there's some some piece of this that we're not looking at for some reason. Yes. So, I mean, I, that's, that's just my opinion. Yeah, because I have an older sister who, they didn't say she had autism because that was back in the 50s and 60s. Right. They told my parents she was, in the term they used back then, mentally retarded. Right. Which you wouldn't use now. All right, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Good luck to your son. Hi. Hi, I'm a middle school special educator, and I want to say thank you because our general population needs to see more books like this to know that everybody's an individual. And it just gives me goosebumps, so thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Yes, hi. hi. Um, just FYI, you and I are besties in my head because okay. we have so much in common. Well, we can talk later and maybe yeah, make I it mean, real. My son is 18, diagnosed at three. I've been married for 19 years. Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, lots of things. So in my head, we know each other. So. Okay. Um, but that being said, my question is around kind of what's going on in the in the world with uh, being a black male in this country. So like right. my son's 18, he's autistic, he's not very verbal. Um, and so I have to send them out into the world every day without those skills, verbal skills, social skills, and how to handle stimulus and, uh, and other people and how they perceive him. And Correct. You know, how do you, how do you approach that with your son in terms of preparing him to be a black man in this country right now and then also have special needs? Well, we did an episode on that for, for Pete's sake very early on um, where we talked about, uh, um, you know, how do we send our son out, you know, without understanding to see, and you in the room probably already know that our kids don't process social cues in the same way as a typical kid would. So the idea of put your hands up or do this or do that. So we ran him through drills. Okay. I mean, like drills, you know, over and over again. Um, but we, and he is, uh, was awesome with it. You know, he's like, okay, mom, okay, mom, I, I got it. Cause we've been doing this with him for many years. Um, the problem is when he comes back and he says, okay, I just watched that video and he complied like you told me, but he still got shot. Yeah. So that's rough. And I'm like, um, hold on, go talk to your dad. <laughs> so now, I mean, so these are issues that we're dealing with, not just with our special kids, but with all kids, all of our kids. Um, and so we just keep talking to them. We keep the dialogue open. We keep talking to them. What I don't want are my kids to become cynical. I want them to feel like they can call the police, they can connect with the police. You know, I don't want them to have this us against them mentality. So I really try to bridge that gap, but I want to keep it real with them at the same time. And they need to understand. I think on the clip, which I thought I had that clip here, but on the clip where uh, I talked to my son about his interaction with police, I said, what do you do if they come to you? He said, reach into my pocket and get my phone and call my mommy. I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not what you do. Um, so, but these are the things that we get from having conversations and continuing. Now, my son has verbal abilities, but he still stumbles and he still a little bit. If you have a nonverbal child or a verbally challenged child, it is really difficult. It, it's hard to relax. So, I understand, but just keep having the conversations. Okay, Bestie? Thank you. <laughs> nice meeting you. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's actually my friend, too. <laughs> oh, okay. So we're all in the same yes. club. But I actually have three kids and two, my two boys have autism. Oh, wow. So I have a 10-year-old who's moderate to severe. He's not really, he will say words. He has acolalia, repeating words. Mm -hmm. um, and he has this little ACC device. Mm -hmm. He's learning that. And then my um, 12, soon to be 13-year-old has Asperger's. Wow. So he talks as much as RJ now. Yeah. <laughs> And my thing is, because I've got a slew of questions, but the one thing for me is how do I stop apologizing for the youngest one, you know, outburst in church and things like that? Or how do I stop being like when people are looking at my kids as if they're having a fit and they're terrible kids that I want to look at them and be like, what? Right. <laughs> what are you looking at? Well, that just comes from advocating because and that's literally one of the reasons why we wrote these books. We want the world to be a little bit more tolerant of special kids, right? So when I'm in the supermarket or my kids acting out, you know, I mean, your first 
the first thought is, oh, that kid needs to be disciplined more. How come you let, can't you control your child? If I had a nickel for every time I heard, can't you control your child, especially on an airplane, because RJ used to just push the, you know, flight attendant button, <laughs> ding, 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 over and over again, kicking the seat, but more than your regular child that would kick the seat. I mean, and, and at first I was angry about the judgment, right? But then I realized, you know, not everybody knows what's happening and they don't I didn't know what autism was before I was di had the diagnosis so I need to be more you know um, compassionate towards people that don't understand and I find that you get a lot more oh I didn't know so when he was kicking his seat my son has autism and he kind of can't help it I'll I'll move over here I'll try to hold his legs or I try to book a seat that has a bulkhead so there's no you know but it's a tough world out there and you know, your son that is dealing with, you know, your youngest son who with the outburst or at church, or whatever, you know, we have to just keep enlightening the community and letting them know that he's special and that's what he does. Now, your older child, the Asperger's thing is very interesting because these are kids that quote unquote don't look like they have autism and they're actually quite brilliant and they're super verbal, but they're socially disconnected. They can't look you in the eye and make a friend. So it's hard, and those are difficult things to try to explain. But the more we talk about it, the more conversations we have, the more people will understand. Good luck with your babies. Thank you. OK. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a part of an organization called Best Buddies, and we work with pairing um, children with different abilities with other children. And so I was just wondering if you had any advice on like how to explain autism to someone who doesn't have experience with it. That's a really good question, and I love Best Buddies. I love doing work with them. Such a great organization, and especially when they started working with kids with autism. Um, it was just a great uh, organization. You know, I just explain autism as, you know, being just, you know, different. And, you know, I, not to push the book, but same but different. You know, it just there, there's a world that they have, and we just have to stop and come into that world. And I think that kids with autism can teach you so much about who you are and teach you patience. Um, but as I said earlier, if you've met one kid with autism, you've only met one kid with autism. Um, I would just say, you know, stop, be patient, try to learn about it, and also try to give back to a family that's experiencing something like autism. So for instance, it may be that they just need you to babysit their other kids for a day. It may be they need something. Um, it's hard to put in words because autism is such a wide spectrum, but the fact that you're working with best, how old are you? I'm 15. And you work with best buddies? Yeah, my high school has a chapter. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we need more 15 year olds like you to work with to, to get the word out, because that's really what, what it is, is getting the word out, especially in the young, with younger kids. I think we have um, one more question, time for one more question. By the way, you, if you all are in line, and I see there's some great people in line. Please feel free to either find me on my Holly Rod website, I answer all the questions, or on social media, I'm at Holly R. Pete. Uh, at, on all social media channels, and today, if you hashtag National Book Fest, I will respond directly to you. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, I have three kids, uh, two twins, a boy and a girl, but my daughter is the one who has autism. And so um, one of the questions, or I think one of the things that uh, is not always addressed or looked at is the impact on the other children. Yes. And um, how you deal with that, like not me, uh, letting it be always about the child with the autism. Right. So I didn't know in your family how you um, had dealt with that. Really go out of our way to schedule time, one-on-one -on -one time with the other kids. I mean, just, you have to have that one-on-one -on -one time where it's just you and them. And so your child with autism is not present. You, you have that relationship. There's that special thing that you do with that other, with that sibling so that they don't feel just, I mean, my daughter, you, my youngest kids used to say, boy, I wish I had autism. You pay more attention to me. You know, I mean, those are the things that you hear. And it's real, you know, but the reality is you have to make that connection and make that carve that time out in any way you can, even if it's just going to the park or just taking a quick field trip. And then just one more question, because we have a... Oh, RJ. Wait, Robert is his name? Hi, Robert. He just wanted to say hello. We follow you on social media. We love the show. We'll co just come a little close. We can't hear you. So much from watching the show. So much of our lives mirror 
yours. Do you all live here locally? No, we're in North Carolina. Okay. North Carolina, but we just want to say thank you for the inspiration, you and RJ and Ryan, because he has a sister, Kendall back there. Okay, just a little closer, we want to hear. 14-year-old Kendall back there, who is his protector. She's his Are they twins? best friend. They're not. They're two years apart. He's 16, uh -huh. but he absolutely was so excited to get in here and see you today. So thank you. Hey, so Robert. Much. Hi. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I'm signing books at 4.30, so I hope to see you all there. Thank you. This has been awesome. What's that? Oh, what's that? Line three. I don't know what that means, but line three. Y'all, you know. I don't, I don't need to know. Someone will take me there. But thank you so much. This was a, a, a great, I tell you, I get more from you, and I appreciate just the energy that you give me, and I appreciate it so much. So thank you all. I'll see you a little later. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.